27. I just finished um, is is to care radio live so that I can say hello there. Ah. Father Lord, we just want to say thank you because it's going to come on. Good morning. So um, today we're going to be looking at Exodus 27. If you were here last week, you would recall reminder that we looked at Exodus 27, 26, and it was like, can this even be the Exodus that we had been re reading before? Today we are going to look at 27 and we are going to be looking at a whole lot of things. And my prayer today is that as we look at Exodus 27, you will begin to see the pattern with which you ought to worship God. In the name of Jesus, I am praying in the name of Jesus and I'm asking you to pray with me that the Spirit of God will be available to us that as we study Exodus 27, that grace will come upon us to be able to maintain our altars come into the courts of heaven and also to always have a partnership with the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. When you go to Exodus 27, you will find that the, the description of inside of the tabernacle was continuing. They have continued the description of the insides of the tabernacle. Is Dukia Radio live now? Okay, hi everyone on Dukia Radio. Good morning. Welcome to Discipleship Class. Today, this thing is not on. What is wrong with you people? I did not. Welcome to Dukia. Uh, welcome and anyway, uh, they're distracting me. Let me come to you. Whatever they do today, let them do. Um, we are looking at Exodus 27. And I said that in Exodus 27, what we see is that the pattern of the, of the tabernacle continued. Last week we looked at the altar and we looked at the patterns and we looked at the things that God wanted us to know about how that the furnishings of the inside of the tabernacle, we looked at the curtains, we looked at words like righteousness, we looked at words like redemption, we looked at um, salvation, we just looked at a whole lot of things. Today, as I began to study Exodus 27, the first thing that I saw was that Exodus 27 was broken into three. In Exodus 23, the Lord spoke about three things. The altar, the court, or the ones that he called, the, the one that is called the outer court, and the oil. The altar, the court, and the oil. And I said, I was lying in my bed and I was meditating. Hi, Eden, good morning. Thank you for joining this morning's class. Pastor Ibiya, good morning. Abiola, I see you. Tina, good morning. Bosa, welcome. That's Wando, good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's going to be a fantastic class today, I promise you. So as we began to, as I began to look at Exodus 27, I saw that there was a breakdown. We had an altar, we have a court, and we have oil. And you know, the reason why I couldn't sleep most of the night was the altar. I kept thinking on the altar. I kept meditating on the altar. And I was just excited that, you know, in building the tabernacle, God will show us the pattern for our journey as Christians. And, you know, we just look at the, at, at the, at the scriptures and sometimes we're like, there is nothing in Exodus. There's nothing in Leviticus. But I promise you, there is a whole lot of stuff inside of these books. So if you open to Exodus 27, the first thing, Shade, my sister, good morning, my see you, Abiola, good morning. You, it says, and thou shalt make, because God was still giving Moses instructions. And the first thing he said to Moses in Exodus 27, he said, thou shalt make an altar of sheeting wood. Thou shalt make an altar of sheeting wood. I mean, if God did not push me to study the scriptures, I would never have known that there is so much inside of this scripture. An altar of sheeting wood. So the first thing I, I was thinking is an altar. What is an altar? What is an altar? What is an altar? The, the definition of an altar, you know, from an online dictionary that I saw, it says that an altar is a structure on which offerings are made to a deity. An altar is a structure on which offerings are made to a deity. The word altar comes from the Hebrew word um, misbeah, which has as its root meaning to slaughter. Altar has as its you know, comes from the, the Hebrew word misbeah, which means to what? To slaughter. And it comes from, the word altar comes from the Greek word to siaterion, which means a place of sacrifice which means a place of sacrifice. An altar is therefore a place where sacrifices are offered. 
even if it doesn't involve slaughtering an altar is an altar when sacrifices are offered in it praise the lord why are you fiddling with that thing Chidebere, he's fiddling with something that would tamper with your connection okay an altar is therefore a place where sacrifice is offered even if it doesn't involve slaughtering so altars typically are made out of wood stone earth brick and metal and the moment I started to look at it, in fact, God wants me to go and study a particular um, character in the Bible and all his altars. But what I started to see is that an altar is a place of sacrifice. And God was saying to Moses, inside of this tabernacle, you will have an altar. Now, this altar is right at the door of the Holy of Holies. You get to the altar before you get into the Holy of Holies. If you remember last week, we said that only the high priest once in a year had access into the holy of holies praise the lord praise the lord so when you begin to look at it you begin to say to yourself now that god is saying raise an altar or erect an altar right outside of the holy of holies praise jesus <coughs> praise jesus but this altar is made of shitting wood shitting wood is also known as acacia wood now, when you think about it, what's the big deal about this wood? Is there anything special about this wood? Does this wood have a special anointing? No. The reason why this wood was the wood that was chosen, one, it was the wood that was available in the wilderness. But beyond that is that this wood was durable. It was not the kind of wood that you used to build a chair and then five months later, it begins to powder. Do you get it? So this was an enduring wood, a wood that will stand the test of time. As a matter of fact, the older it got, the better this wood became. Now, so what does this mean? Why do we need to build an altar? Because you begin to see the specificity of the cubits, the length, the breadth of the altar. Today, the altar can be likened. It's not likened. The altar is a type of the cross. Yes, because the cross is the place of, place of the ultimate sacrifice. Praise the Lord. So we are looking at the altar. So we begin to look at the altar from Exodus 27 this morning. Abele, good morning. It's your mind. see you. Good morning. You will begin to see one thing. That this altar stands, we can look at it from three different levels. From the level of the Old Testament where it was put together, where Moses had to erect it so that the children of Israel can have worship. Offer sacrifices to God. From there, when we move to the place where you see it as a symbol, as a type of the cross, where Jesus paid the ultimate price of the ultimate sacrifice. And then when we come back and look at the altar, as you and me, while we ought to make our lives an altar so that we can live a sacrificial life every day. After all, Jesus said that he that, be, he that will follow me, let him take up his cross daily. He that will be my disciple, let him daily take up his cross and follow me. Do you remember that scripture? Now, if we say that the altar is a type of the cross, it means that we can actually interpret what Jesus said to, to be, if you will be my disciple, take your altar and follow me. Do you understand it? So when you are looking at erect an altar in Exodus 27, you are not just looking at one thing that is being done so that people can come and slaughter chicken on top of it. That was the way it was for that time. But in the dispensation in which we are, there is the altar that was erected on the cross at Calvary so that Jesus can die and pay for you and me and now relegate into the background or nullify the need for us to come to a physical altar. Praise Jesus. But because of that sacrifice that Jesus did for you and me, what automatically it puts on us is a responsibility for us to daily bear our own crosses, live sacrificial lives so that we can become the light of the earth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So let me go to my notes so that I'll take it one step after another. It says, um, an altar is a place where the divine and the human interact. An altar is a place where the divine 
and the human come for an interaction. Praise the Lord. My husband will say to you that an altar is a transactionary place where you come and exchanges are made. Do you get it? You bring your sin for his righteousness. You bring your loss for his gain. You bring your pain for his joy. You bring your mourning for... I, I don't know whether you get it. That is what an altar indicates or, or symbolizes. And God was saying to Moses, set up one inside of the tabernacle. Remember we talked about the tabernacle being there what? The habitation of God where he will meet with the people. And we said that the altar was what? Uh, was what now? A type of the presence of God. So when you get into the presence of God, what should happen? When you get into the presence of God, exchanges are made. You bring all that you are not able to be. You drop it so that he can give you the enablement for all that you can be. Praise Jesus. You bring your sins and you drop them and you claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when you begin to talk about an altar, one of the things that stands out is that a sacrifice is the primary medium of altar interactions. Sacrifice is the primary medium of altar interactions. Any altar that does not entail sacrificial sacrifices is no altar. Do you understand it? Is a powerless what? Altar. Now let's to take two steps back. How many of us, okay, I agree, we don't go to Babalao or we've never gone before. Let's just assume that we've never gone to Babalao before. But we watch them on African magic, don't we? Nollywood. Every time you a man or a woman comes before a Babalao, there is an altar, right? Is there an altar? Yes. Whatever they ask you to bring, they will sometimes they say to them, go and draw it at the, at the, at the altar. Am I correct? Yes. They slaughter stuff on the altar. Why do you think that the people of the world, the devils and his minions, understand the power in an altar? And unfortunately, the church does not understand it. Because everything in the heaven, the spiritual governs the physical. So if they make you do those things. So, for instance, in the days of Babalawo, I know we don't go there anymore. If you go and you don't give a sacrifice, when you leave, there is a the tendency that you don't feel like what you have come for, you will get it. In fact, the Baba will tell you that until you bring something, you can't get something. Am I correct? Now, imagine that God knew that that is, that is a template from heaven. That is a, don't imagine. I need you to understand that that is a template of heaven. So for, to set it down so that we see how it is run, it was put in Exodus. There must be a place where the human can come so that he can transact with the divine. So in the Old Testament, it was a physical altar that was built. Praise the Lord. But in the New Testament, Jesus bore the cross. Jesus became the sacrifice on the eternal altar. Praise the Lord. And he did that to show you and me an example of how we ought to live our lives. Daily laying it down. Am I confusing you? Can you see the um, the, the correlation of the things I'm trying to say to you? So he said to him, make an altar of sheeting wood. I've told us that the sheeting wood is a wood that doesn't, um, doesn't, uh, what's the word? It doesn't powder, it doesn't spoil. Let's put it that way. It's not a wood that rots on time. It's a wood that can stand years and years and years and years and years. How many of us know that the sacrifice at the cross endure it forever? That's why it was an ordinary wood. They, they, you know they could have said, it because it was Greek. It was rough. It was, it, there was a civilization in the time that Jesus went to the cross. They could have gotten fiber, fiber optic crosses because that would have been light for him to carry up Golgotha. Do you get what I'm trying to say? But they made him carry an, a, a cross of wood which meant that he had to be heavy. Do you get it? Why? Because, see, the Old Testament is a foreshadow of the new. 
If God will make Moses erect a wooden altar, then for sacrifice, for the remission of sins in that time, for the ultimate remission of sins, there would have to be a sacrifice on top of a wooden altar again. This time, it was shaped like a cross. But the darnest thing is that in Exodus 27, we see that if you look at your Bible in verse 2 or, or 3, let me see. In verse number 2, he says you should make four horns and the four corners. So you have an altar. When you put a horn here, you put a horn here, you put a horn there, you put a horn there. What do you get? You get a cross. I'll begin to break that horn down for you so that you understand what was captured inside of Exodus 27. I hear that a broadcast on Dukia Radio is on and off. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. And that should make the horns of it upon the four corners. Let me go to the wood because I need to walk this down so that we, we get it. The cross typifies the humanity of Christ as well as the redemption of man. On the cross, remember the cross is one wood like this, one wood like this. Eh? Humanity of Christ. Because I don't know whether I said it here. I didn't say it here, but I said it as sister power, both in Zurich and in Lagos. That the biggest thing, what makes Jesus' sacrifice heavy and heavier than any other sacrifice is that he died a man for us men i told us that if jesus had died had come as god and he had come in the form of god to try and to save you and me what do you expect from a god you expect that god would save you is that not what it is but it became a sacrifice when he came as a man so the greatest part of Jesus for me is that he came as man. Because in coming as man, he came and what is it? He, he had to humble himself. He had to lower his status. He had to limit himself. Just so that he can stay on an altar of wood. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the cross typifies or the altar typifies the human, the cross typifies the humanity of Christ and the redemption of man. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Now, when you begin to check the dimensions of the altar, you'll find out that the dimension of the altar is a four square. That's how the four square church got their name. The dimensions of the altar, when you draw them out they form a four square and you know that at the middle of the four square is a cross are you listening to me so exodus moses was not being told just anything moses was being shown the pattern of the ultimate redemption that man would enjoy of course i don't think that moses would have understood it beyond his time but we have lived both type at least we didn't live in the old testament but we have the benefit of it's been chronicled for us so we can look back actually and begin to see it and say yes this was what god was saying all the while in the old testament he knew that that's that method was not going to be enough he was he would have to come and do something a lot more perfect praise the lord so the dimensions of the altar built a four square which symbolized the exactness and sameness of the cross. The exactness. If it's four square, what it was also saying, or what is also saying is that it doesn't matter whether the gospel is preached in the north, or the south, or the east, or the west. Guess what it is? It is the same. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter how we, um, what's the word, interpret it and what doctrines we build out of the gospel. The gospel is a very simple message. Jesus was God. He came as man. He died for man so that he can forgive our sins and restore us to the Father. And by his dying, he's giving man the capacity to live as God. That's the message of the, of the gospel. That's the message of the cross. It doesn't matter in one language you try to preach it. It doesn't matter in what town you try to preach it. It doesn't matter whether you preach it to a rich man or to a poor man. That is how simple this and exact this message is. Anything outside of this is not the gospel. 
Do you understand it? So if the message says Jesus was is God, but it does not recognize Jesus the man who died, it's an incomplete gospel. If it recognizes Jesus as God and as man, but it does not recognize the resurrected Christ, it's an incomplete gospel. If it recognizes all these three, and yet it does not recognize the salvation that the resurrected Christ brings, it is still an incomplete gospel gospel. If it does all of this and it does not recognize the fact that this just by going through this man is empowered to live as God, it is still an incomplete gospel. Praise the Lord. So the dimensions in Exodus point to how exact God wanted the message of the gospel to be. Praise the Lord. Now the truth of the matter is if man would take time and study and learn these things, we will all speak with one voice. We will all speak one language because the language is not a the the message is not a contradictory message. Praise the Lord. So when you look at it in verse three, it says, "And thou shalt," it says, "No, verse three says, and thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass." His horns, his horns shall be of the same. That meant that in dimensions, even the horns are the same. Praise the Lord. See, salvation on the north and salvation in the south. Salvation to the rich man and salvation to the poor man is what? Salvation. It doesn't change. But there was something else it said. It said you shall overlay it with brass. What is brass? What is brass? Because I said to you, we we'll look at the elements. When you look at the brass, brass is um, is indicative of. Um, I'm trying to look for it now. Okay, I remember now. Brass. See, this thing was made of wood. Horns were put on it. Then they covered it with brass. You will be thinking that is an altar, an altar of the Most High God. I would have chosen to cover it with gold. What do you think? What do you think? It should be gold, which was exactly what, um, a manner in the manner of speaking, David was trying to do when he was bringing the ark back. So, in bringing the ark back, he started to put. He decided to put it on the cart, not on the shoulders of man, because he was not compliant with the civilization of the day. In my own civilization, I will overlay this altar with gold but they overlaid it with brass do you know why because in they said until even up to now if you find unadulterated brass it is it can withstand fire more than gold silver and all the other uh, all the other uh, metals do you get it brass can stand fire longer it is a lot more fire resistant which meant that when you pull, overlay it with um with um with brass, it doesn't matter what it goes through, it will endure. Remember, it's we're coming from a wood that will endure. We've now gone on to an overlay of brass. Praise the Lord. Now, that is indicative of what Jesus had to go through on the cross. Yet, what happened? He, he, I would have got, I, in fact, I can't carry the cross for two minutes. Not to talk of let anybody dead me on it. I will sing like a canary. I will so renounce God. That even though I was God, I will renounce God. There was no way I was going to submit myself to it. We know it was painful because he went to the garden of Gethsemane. And he, while he was there, he tried to pray his way out of it. We know it was hard because the Bible said that his sweat was like blood. We know it was hard because he was whipped. How many times? 39 stripes on his back. We know it was weak because he carried the cross and he fell a number of times. Times. And ultimately, they had to commandeer Simon the Cyrene to come and carry it for him. We know it was hard. It was, in today's language, fire. But he passed through it just so that you and me can stand today and call Jesus. And then when we're calling Jesus, we're feeling like we're calling our friend. When we're calling Jesus, we're feeling like we're a privileged set of people, and we are. When we're calling Jesus, we're feeling like nobody's like us, and it is the truth. Because we're now special. But we have, sometimes we forget what it took so that that name can be available to us. 
Praise the Lord. God knew that this thing will pass through fire. So he told Moses, put brass on top of it so that it will go through fire. Because how did he say it? He says, when you pass through the fire, I will be with you. Or it shall not overwhelm you. So then he said, when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what will happen? I will be with you. Praise the Lord. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? So we look at it and we say, okay, this symbolizes, so what is, what does the horn stand for really? What does it stand for? The horn stands for salvation. Let me explain it to you. In those days, in the Old Testament, you, that's why Jesus is called the horn of our salvation. But in those days, if you go to, um, 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 I'm trying to find it. It was in Second Kings, I think. It was in Second Kings when Adonijah had done something wrong and Solomon wanted to deal with him. Solomon wanted to kill him. So Adonijah ran into the temple and he grabbed the horns of the altar because the horns of the altar was a place of refuge. When It doesn't matter. That is when premeditated sin was committed. But the person ran into the temple and he grabbed hold of the horns. That person is forgiven. Now you need to understand that we have salvation today not only for the sins that we committed that we didn't know were sin. We have salvation for the sins that we knew. When we were going, we knew it was wrong. Uh, people will tell me that when they would, when they were, so most of the sins we committed, we know they were. In fact, some of the ones I committed after I became a Christian, I actually was going and God called me and said, Be don't go. I said, God, wait first, I'm coming. When I come back, I will repent. Do you get it? But God, because God knew us, He knows our frame. He made available the horn in Moses' day. So that when a man sins and sins and sins, like, you know, the Bible says we drink iniquity like water. And you run into, and then you now see death coming. You run into the tabernacle or the temple, and you hold this horn, you are forgiven. That's why it does not matter what a man is done. If that man lays hold of Jesus Christ, because the Bible says he is the horn of our salvation. As long as you can find Jesus. And you can begin to scream. Jesus that son of David have mercy on me. Jesus I'm sorry I did it I know. But I'm so sorry have mercy. He looks upon you. Down from the cross. And guess what he says. It is finished. When we started, I asked you, I said, when you read your Exodus 27, what did you see? But the horn was there. Jesus as the salvation of mankind, mankind was represented. That scripture I was talking about was 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50 to 53. You see the story of a man who ran into the temple, held the horn, and because of that, Solomon could not kill him anymore. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. And then when you go to first Samuel eight, uh, sorry, when you go to Psalm 18 verse 2, Psalm 18 verse 2, let's look at it. Why are you laughing, Christopher? Psalm 18 verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I was trust, my buckler, and what? The horn of my salvation, my high tower. So when you see the horn that they are putting on the altar, it was indicative that any man that comes to this altar will find salvation. That's why no man comes to the cross too dirty that the blood of Jesus can't wash him clean. No man comes to the cross too filthy that the blood of Jesus cannot deal with his situation. It doesn't matter. It says, call, it says, if your sin be as red as scarlet, I shall do what? They shall be white as snow. If they be as crimson, they shall be as wool. Do you get it? There is nothing that comes to the altar because the salvation of God is seated at the altar that God cannot deal with. I am grateful for the altar. 
I'm even more grateful now that I know it, that they put it in the Old Testament, which meant if I never did get to see a New Testament Bible, I can still access salvation. I don't know whether you get it. Oh, this glass is too dull for my liking. Praise Jesus. So Psalm 18 verse 2 refers to the Lord as the horn of our salvation. Jesus today is the horn of our salvation. How do I know? Open to your Luke chapter 1. I made up my mind that I will show you the scriptures so that you don't think that I'm here to tell you stories. Luke chapter 1 verse 69. Luke 1 69. It says, let's read, it says, and had, let's read from 68. It says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he had visited and what? Redeemed his people. And had raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now, how many of us know that Jesus is both the root of Jesse and the offspring of David? So you can tell that this scripture in Luke chapter 1 verse 69 is referring to Jesus. Praise the Lord. But before we ever got into the New Testament conversation, Jesus was present in Exodus 27 as the horn on the altar. Are you with me? Are you with me? I'm not speaking heresy. That's why I'm trying my best to show you correlating scriptures. Praise the Lord. Now, this altar, the entire altar was overlaid with brass. In research, I found that unadulterated brass has a higher resistant quality to fire and corrosion. So just like the shetim wood is overlaid, is endures, it is now overlaid with brass so that it will endure even more. To symbolize the enduring capacity of salvation. That's why when you get born again and you truly get born again, your issue now is not to get born again again. Your issue is to maintain the salvation that you have received. Praise the Lord. One salvation can last you a lifetime. Hear me. That one salvation is enough for a lifetime as long as you maintain it. Please, I did not say once saved, forever saved. I said that one salvation can do what? Last you a lifetime as long as you maintain it. Praise the Lord. So it's not just confess and do nothing about your confession and imagine that you are saved. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that if you are truly saved and you begin to walk, begin and continue to walk with Christ, you don't need to be saved again. Are you with me? Why? Because the altar is made of things that endure. Jesus' life is a life that has no end. Eh? That's why he came to us and what he brought to us was life everlasting. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So, let's go on. We're still looking at the altar. Why again will I say that your salvation endures? Because in John chapter 8 verse 36, the Bible says, He whom the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. So the truth of the matter is, if you truly receive salvation... You don't need to receive anything else. You just need to now walk out your salvation. With what? Yeah. Fear and trembling. That's the one that trips us. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. But I'll show you something. Why the salvation we have in Christ is better than the one that we had in the Old Testament. I told you that in 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 50 to 53... That what had happened was someone had sinned. He had actually com committed an atrocious, I think it was treason. What he committed was akin to treason. And the king had leeway to kill him. But he ran off and he grabbed the horns. And because of that, they couldn't kill him anymore. Remember. 
But in Amos chapter 9, when the children of Israel sinned and God got really upset. In Amos, Amos chapter 3, sorry, verse 14, the Lord said to them, he said, let's go to Amos. If you find it, if, especially if you're on your phone. Amos chapter 3, verse 14, I want you to read it for me. Amos 3, 14. Who is there? Amos 3, Yes. Mm. I will also visit the altars of Bethel, mm. and the thorns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Praise the Lord. God sold the children of Israel. That's why what we have is a better covenant. At some point, God was so frustrated with them, and He said, The day I will visit them with judgment, I will go into the temple and I will remove the horns of the altar. Let me explain it to you. Because these people were sinning knowingly. They, they, they knew that it was sin, but they didn't care because in their mind we have the horn. When God wants to kill us, we will run in and we will hold the horn. So God warned them. He said, I am coming. I will break the horns off. They will fall to the ground. Because if there is no horn, you can't grab, which means the structure comes. But the horn that we have, I don't see whether you see where I'm going. The horn that we have is forever seated at the right hand of God the Father, constantly making intercession for us. Praise Jesus. So, when you take a look at the altar, I've told you that remember that the altar... Is a, form, is a type of the cross. Praise the Lord. I've told you that the altar is a place where you come so that you can make sacrifices so that you can get an exchange for a full life. Praise the Lord. I told you that the altar is what Jesus, where Jesus came so that we can be redeemed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's verse 1 to, I think, 8 that we had looked at. Now, when you go to Oh no, before we get to verse, uh, we finish verse 8. In verse number 3, it says, And that shall make his pants to receive his ashes. The Bible also talks about ashes. Why, why do we need to talk about ashes? Why? You know, because I was asking God, what is in this scripture? There's no Wednesday. I don't tell God, let me skip. But in verse 3, I saw that the ashes, it says, You shall make pants to receive the ashes. Ashes speak to what? Thorough burning. You don't find ashes until something is burnt. Are you, are you, do you remember that? Yes. So, when you have ashes from an altar, it means that the sacrifice that was put on it was thoroughly burnt, which meant that it was received. Because when the Lord did not receive an offering in those days, it will not be consumed. So when an offering was pray, or a sacrifice is placed on the altar, what was placed on the altar in those days, proof that God had accepted it was that it was be burnt and the ashes becomes the memorial that what you gave to God was received. Do you get it? Now you are wondering, is there ashes in the New Testament? Oh yes, there's ashes on the same cross on top of the altar. After Jesus had gone through every kind of, I don't know what is, what is worse than what he went through with his last breath what did jesus dis declare it is finished which means that this sacrifice that i have made for you it is accepted because of that everything the devil can ever throw upon you is finished today it will have no hold over you Amen. are you seeing it so that was why there was a, a special pan and bucket and shovel because when they finish um, the sacrifice, the man who came to offer the sacrifice takes the ashes out as proof that God accepted his offering. You don't need to carry ashes now. You just need to remember that Jesus finished the work. What that meant was that if Jesus had cut short that journey, then it would have meant that we have no ashes. But because he went through and he finished and he said, it is finished. 
you can take your salvation to the bank and use it to cash money. Praise Jesus. I said, every time you see ashes, you know that what you have placed on the altar was consumed. In our New Testament, Jesus on the cross was the, the ultimate altar proclaimed that it is finished, which would have been represented by ashes in the Old Testament. All our sin was put upon him on the cross, and his proclamation, it is finished, was an announcement that the sacrifice had, that had been offered that the sacrifice had been offered, accepted, and gone up to God as a sweet-smelling savor. Most of us, but most of all, was that by this sacrifice and by these ashes, you and I have been what? Redeemed. Praise Jesus. Now, we've looked at Jesus on the altar and the cross as part of the altar. And we've looked at Moses' altar. I want us to look at you as the altar. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Praise the Lord. Now, you need to recognize quickly that if your body is the temple, then it means that the things that were in the temple belong in your body as well. So if an altar was put in the body, in the temple, then you have an altar. I'm imagining that you know where your altar is now. Where is it? Where is your altar? Your heart. That's why when Bush came to shove in Ezekiel, he prayed, he said, he said, God said, he said, I will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Praise the Lord. I was going to do the exchange again. Do you remember that I said that an altar is a place of exchange or do you don't remember? So when we begin to look at you as an altar, you remember that you, there is a seat of transaction in you. It is called your heart. Praise the Lord. So everything that comes, that's why the Bible says it's not what comes out of a man. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of him that defiles him. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, when you go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says something like this. He says, I beseech you, dear four brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I'm talking to you about an altar, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. So, Moses had an altar. Jesus became went became the sacrifice on an altar and you ought to follow his example and be a sacrifice every single day remember that i told you that an altar is useless if sacrifices are not made on it it has no power that's why when you go to babalawo those of you that still go stop by the way you must bring something to put there and somebody say i'm not going yes but your mother is going on your behalf what's the difference I just asked a question. You are not going, but your, your parents are going on your behalf. What's the difference? Yes, yeah, he made in your name. And then some of us, we even go the step further. I say, I didn't go. I just gave them money. I'm sorry for you. No wonder you're not moving forward. Why? What are you doing that the Holy Spirit will not show you that what you are giving, they are going to use it for something else? How can you not know? Especially something that has the capacity to break you down like that. Are you listening to me? But my point is not to judge anybody today. I will do, I'll leave the judging for another day. My point is you ought to be another altar. Praise the Lord. It says, if in the first tabernacle an indestructible and effective altar was built in the tabernacle and, this, and in the second tabernacle, Jesus himself set up and went on the altar, which is the cross. Then we ought to remember that each and every one of us, as his own, that is as Jesus' property, must own, must have an altar or become an altar or sacrifice. When they say present your bodies, a living sacrifice, are they going to slaughter you in the air? Why are they going to put you on an altar? 
That's why for those of us that come to encompass us, I've told you before that dead men walking is the standard. If you are not dead, forget it. And I told you that dead men don't feel pain. That's why when the fire comes, because I talked to you about um, the fact that they put brass on top. Because they put brass on top because surely fire will hit the altar. That, you know, there is nothing that insulates a Christian from fire. When I say fire, I mean the hardship of life. But what you ought to know is that if you remain on the altar, the only thing that can come off of you is the dress, the things you don't need. Because the Bible says, I refine you in the furnace of affliction. So when you put yourself on the altar, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, what will be burnt out by the fire of life are the things that make you unholy. If you guys know how hard I'm trying, you'll be trying to smile so that I know that I'm working hard. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, what we need to begin to look at is because of what of that which God has planned and Jesus has finished, we too can lay down our lives daily and ensure that our lives become a place where humanity can come and embrace divinity. I've told us in this class before that God said to me, he said, the Bible is not a book for the unbeliever. Because most of us are still buying Bibles to dash the unbeliever. Don't waste your money. They won't read it because they don't know the power in it. But you become the Bible that they read. They will now need a proper Bible. Do you get it? How That is where you become the altar. Where because of your life, because of the things. You know, someone is treated you. The Bible says, um, pray for those who hurt you. And someone is hurting you deliberately And all you're doing is praying for them and showing them love After a while The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins After a while they will give up Because they've been trying to put you down And you are just rising above it And one day They will come to you and they will ask you How do you do it? That day You become the sacrifice on the altar That was effective but before you get to the day that they will come and ask you, how did you do it? You know, they would have really pressed your buttons, right? So don't tell me I'm a Christian. Because I'm a Christian, I don't talk to unbelievers again. Because I'm a Christian, yes, I don't go where they go. But it also tells me that because I'm a Christian, I cannot afford to punish unbelievers. The only thing I can do is become the sacrificial lamb for them so that I may show them that at the altar, divinity can be, uh, humanity can be exchanged for divinity. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. When we become the altar, what happens is that we embrace divinity so that we can uphold the standard of God and establish his will on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your responsibility is to do what? Establish the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It is only the people who have died, who have been slaughtered on the altar, that can see what the will of God is in heaven. Do you get it? Praise Jesus. I think we have enough. Praise Jesus. Now, when you recognize that an altar without a sacrifice is no altar, you begin to see how that to maintain what Christ has done, we need to lay our lives down. We don't need to slaughter a goat. We don't need to buy doves. We don't need to do rams. But your life is required. Put it down. That's why Jesus said it like this. He said, whosoever will be my disciple, take up your cross. I told you, I said, if we translate it, it means take up your altar and follow me. Because as you are carrying the altar, you are the one that will carry your altar on your head by yourself. When you get to the place that they want to slaughter you, tell them, wait, let me arrange my altar. You will pit it down. You will lie on it. You will arrange yourself the way that Isaac arranged himself. Because I've told you before that there was no way a man who was 130 years could have 
tied down with a man who was 30 years. Except the man who was 30 years allowed him. So that is why you, when you get to the place where they say the only thing that will work is they will kill you. You will by yourself lay on the altar and say do what you will. Why? Because you know that Jesus has said it is finished. You know that the Bible says that they can kill your flesh. But they cannot take the part of you that is important. That matters your spirit. I don't know whether you get it. Every time we stand as representatives of the kingdom. We need to recognize that when we catch flak. When we catch fire. When we see wind. When we see storm. Things will rage at us. But if you are lying on the altar then you ought to be dead. And if you are dead, you don't you don't see that fire is coming. And if you don't see that fire is coming, you can't get up and run. So show me a man who is supposed to be carrying his cross daily. Who is still running in and out. And I will show you a man who is not carrying a cross. I'm trusting God that you can hear. Praise Jesus. I said that in Exodus 27, there are three things. The altar, the court, and the oil. I want to go to the court. The court, you find the court, everything about the court or the outer court from verse 9 to 19. From verse 9 to 19. Verse 9, it says, And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle for the south side southward. There shall be hangings for the court of the of fine twinned linen of an hundred cubits long for one side. And the twenty pillars, these are just the description of the outer court. I want to talk to you about the significance of the outer court. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The court had at its furnishing. Let's explain that first. Fine linen. Praise the Lord. Who remembers what I talked about fine linen last week? What did I say it meant? Who can remember? Righteousness. righteousness. Yes. I said that it was righteousness. It was righteousness. So you will see that the outer court, the outer court was is also the place of meeting. Praise the Lord. Remember that it, only the priest can go into the Holy of Holies. Do you remember? But every other person can come to the altar, outer court so that they can meet with God. Hallelujah. Now, in, when you come into the outer court, just before you get to the door that leads to the Holy of Holies, you see the altar. Praise the Lord. Now we have dealt with the altar. We have now come out. To the outer court, praise the Lord. Now we want to look at what the outer court in, uh, signifies. The outer court signifies or indicates or typifies a place of meeting where man can come and meet with God. Praise the Lord. Pr praise the Lord. Because you can have an altar. You cannot have an altar if you don't have a place where you meet. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now because... Like I said, only a few people could go beyond the the, uh, the outer court. The outer court was designate was the designated meeting place of the people with God. To use fine linen meant that it was righteousness. Praise the Lord. It meant that anyone who comes into the outer court, automatically righteousness in the New Testament is imputed upon him. Praise the Lord. Remember that it is not by works lest any man should boast. It is a righteousness that what dash to you is like a bonus. Praise the Lord. Do you understand it? So when you come out from the outer and you enter into this court, the place of meeting, automatically the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the linen that was used to surround the entire out court becomes what? You. Praise the Lord. That's why it talks about being clothed in righteousness. Are you listening to me? Now when you look at that thing, it talked about that, that, that they will have 20 pillars whose base will be made by copper. Are made with copper. Praise the Lord. Now, the base of these 20 pillars made with copper, copper stands for judgment. Praise the Lord. When a man enters into Christ, when Christ looks at him, even with all of the righteousness that Jesus has, when he looks at the man, the man qualifies for one thing and one thing alone. What is it? Judgment. Praise the Lord. But because God is full, these copper sockets have hooks. And these hooks are used to hold the curtains together. And these hooks are made up of silver. Silver is what? Redemption. 
So I need you to see what happens in the court. The righteousness of God draws you in. And where you deserve judgment, you receive redemption. Oh, that was too flat. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then when you read further down, you will see that concerning the pillars, it talked about 60 pillars. And these 60 pillars are, are put all over the place in fives, in batches of five, which mean grace. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So when you come into the court of God, which is when you come into a place of a relationship with God, praise the Lord, what you deserve is what? Judgment, but because of the righteousness of Christ Jesus, what you get is what redemption, redemption which is imputed unto you by what grace. grace. This is your Bible, this is what people are jumping in there. It's here. Praise the Lord. Amen. You need to recognize that you can't come into the courts. That is into the place of a relationship with Jesus based on I did not sin yesterday. You cannot come based on my father was a bishop before. You cannot come based on my tithe in church is the highest or biggest tithe. You can only come based on what? The finished works of Jesus Christ. Can you see the correlation between the altar and the court? Are you listening to me? And even then, when you come in, I talked about the copper qualifies you to be judged. But because the finished work is hooked to God, what you find is redemption. Praise the Lord. What is the significance of the outer court? Of the, of the court? As we journey in Christ, it is important to recognize and always remember that our salvation and redemption is maintained on the altar. Please write this down. I, would, I want to dictate it. As we journey in Christ, it is important to recognize and always remember that our salvation and redemption is maintained on the altar of sacrificial living within the courts of relationship. Should I go again? As we journey with Christ or we journey in Christ, it is important to recognize and, rem and always remember that our salvation and our redemption is maintained on the altar of sacrificial living within the courts of what? Relationship. Should I break it down? If you have no relationship... Eh? Mm? You can't live a sacrificial life. If you cannot live a sacrificial life, the redemption and the salvation you have received will not be maintained. Sacrificial living within the courts. What I've done is I've taken all the words we've looked at so far, or most of the words we've looked at so far, and I have formulated like a purpose statement so that every day when you wake up, you recognize that today, if I am carrying my cross like Jesus said I should carry it, and I'm following him like wherever he takes his foot from is where I put my foot. Here is what I will, I will not forget. I will not forget that all of my salvation and all of my redemption is maintained by how much of this altar or this cross that I carry based on the personal relationship that I have with him. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So you need to recognize that there is, recognize that the court is how we meet with him daily. That's why in Psalm 100, what does it say? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and I will come into his courts with praise. When you enter the courts of God and you see in your mind's eye what has been achieved for you, 
Because remember that God is holy and he cannot behold iniquity. The first thing that should happen to you when you run into the courts, the way you look, just as you are, is that they should kill you. But when you remember that because salvation is in that on that altar, when you remember that redemption is hooked onto, onto judgment, or what can you do but to just like, I don't know, just fall on your face and just worship. That's what I'll do. Praise Jesus. Today, the court, sorry, there is a need for us to recognize that the court is how we meet with him daily. To nurture our relationships so we can fulfill our own callings and mandates. You cannot fulfill your calling and your mandates just trying to do it. I don't know where you are doing it. Do you get it? Do you get it? It is therefore counterproductive if after God has given us his only spirit, who is the maintainer of the relationship, I will show you very soon, that we don't show up for him and to him. Praise Jesus. I don't want you to be confused. I need you to understand this. So that the quality of your life will go from here to here. That's the only thing that works. Now, I could do these things before and I was doing them. Maybe because I, I personally, I can hear the Holy Spirit and I just follow. I, most of the things may not make sense to me, but I follow. Do you get it? You won't believe that I'm now coming to understand the principles behind most of the things that I'm doing. But you may not have been doing them. Today I'm bringing you both the principle. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit is bringing you the understanding. So that you can arrange yourself properly. You say this Christianity, I have found that it is hard and it is easy. It is hard if you try to do it by yourself. It is easy if you submit to the one who is supposed to be doing it. I just let you. It's like they throw paper in water. That's the way I run. I'm like paper in water. As long as the force of the water or the current of the water is strong. What do you think will happen to my paper? It will continue to float. Which one was I mean? I don't know whether you get it. It is hard work when you are trying to figure it out. It is easier when you follow the flow. And so what I have found out is that most Christians live who hear God and transact with what they hear God say to them. Live for a long time before they understand the principle behind it. I would never have understood this principle until God is forcing me to study Exodus. You think I haven't read Exodus before? I read, I've read Exodus before and then I, I have, now I can see the way I read it. I'll read verse 1 and I'll jump to verse 7 because make, let's hurry, let the chapter be over. Because his wood, his cubits, his left, his right doesn't just make sense. Nothing looks like it's there. But the more you walk with the Spirit of God, that's why Jesus, in talking to his disciples, I'm speaking to you. I wish I could open myself up so that you can see what I know. That's why when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said to them, he said, I speak to you in parables. Because some things are not given until you transition from a child to a son. Which is why you cannot afford to go daily or go Go at your pace as you like. The only way to do this thing is continue to go with him. When you understand it, praise the Lord, dance, explain it to other people. The day you don't understand it, crawl in. It doesn't matter, but never stop. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yes. Today, the court isn't a place. The court is a vibrant relationship that grants us access to the Holy of Holies where we can personally host the presence of God. 
where he becomes the when the bible begins to say that the tabernacle of god is with men in revelation it means that you have transitioned and transacted transacted in such a way that god sees no need to hide anything from you he just comes and he dumps it inside of your spirit man that's the difference between the generous in the faith and all of us that are still trying to stand on one leg that's the difference but you will recognize that if we call someone a general, general, a general does not become a general lying in his bedroom. He becomes a general because of the number of wars that he has fought and he had come out victorious. And I need you to recognize that coming out victorious from a war is not the same thing as coming out from a war or not wounded. Which means that some of these generals might have been carried out because they couldn't run out on their own. But the thing is that they still got the victory because they came out with their life and they came back out with their faith. Because a lot of Christians go into the battle, they come out with their life, but they left their faith behind. Which meant that in the midst of battle, they said to the devil, just take anything you want, let me go. The devil doesn't want your money. He doesn't spend money. He doesn't want to, the devil doesn't want your children. He doesn't have a home to keep them in. The devil doesn't want your car. He has no need to drive from one place to another. The only thing that the devil needs from you is your profession of Jesus Christ, which is your faith. That's why every time, if it's easy, and he can get you to renounce. Hey, sis, good morning, ma. Renounce Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. He will bless you. The devil can bless too. He will make you rich. Anything could make you never remember again that you used to have Jesus as your personal Lord and your Savior. So to be a general in the faith means that you went into battle. You not only came out with your life, you came out with your faith intact. Praise the Lord. And when, remember I said I didn't say you, your faith will not be wounded. Did I say so? I did not say any of those things. I only just said that you come out with it anyway. Praise Jesus. Amen. The third element that we see in Exodus 27 is the oil. You, and this is found in two verses alone, verse 20 and 21. In verse 20 it says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel, that they bring the pure oil olive, oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. Praise Jesus. Number one, he told Moses, build an altar. Abi, he told him, this is what you will do in the courts. Am I correct? Yes. But when he got to the oil, he said, command the children of Israel to bring. Ladies and gentlemen, there is something called corporate anointing. I'm going to come to that. There is come something come, called corporate anointing that happens when hearts are neat as one, believing as one, so that there is nothing that is impossible in the place of prayer. Hallelujah. I can tell you that today because I am experiencing it now. There are women that I'm not even sure I will ever meet in the physical that we're praying together right now online. And the power that shows up every day as we pray, the power that shows up, the things that the Lord does that the next morning, there is no morning since we started this um, the prayer. We do it seven days a month. There is no morning I wake up that I will not have received either a WhatsApp message, a Facebook message, or something testifying to the power of God that went out the previous evening. It's amazing. But here's the thing about the oil. Look at your scripture properly. It did not say they should bring the oil in the bottle. They said they should bring the olive that makes the oil. Now, why do they need oil in the temple or in the tabernacle? I'm going to break it down for you. For starters, if you remember last week when we were talking, we, talked, we said that within the tabernacle, on the, on the ark, they had what? The gold candle stands. I mean, 
Do you remember we said the candle stands? We said it will give you illumination. It will give you direction. We talked about it here. Praise the Lord. But that was the only light that God made Moses put in that. And you know that if it's a big tabernacle and people are going to be coming in to worship, they need more light, right? Here's the thing about us and church. And if you've been wondering why it looks like there's so much darkness inside of church, because you don't bring your lights. You don't. When he came to light, God said to Moses, tell the children of Israel to contribute. They didn't get it. Holy Spirit, please. I said, when he came to the issue of light, what did he say? He said the children of Israel should contribute. They should go and bring the olives. And then when the olives is, are brought, is brought, do you know what will happen? They will press it. All of you that want bread and butter Christianity, I am laughing in tongues. The oil can come out if you are not pressed. Now, how many of us know who the oil is? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the oil. What do I know? You should go and read the story of the ten virgins. What they were lacking was the Spirit of God. So they missed the moment when the bridegroom showed up. And in Exodus, God was saying, I can build this wonderful tabernacle. I can do it all by myself because I'm God. I have the capacity. But it will be better because what God wants to do is train you, according to Matthew chapter 5, to be the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. Is that not what your Bible says? The training, why I said that you are, you are important as an altar. It's because what happens when you become a fervent, effective altar is that light emanates from you. And as light begins to emanate from you, what happens is that the people you come across, darkness begins to dissipate from their lives just because you are in their lives. I don't know whether I'm... I, 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 am I trying too hard? I'm trying too hard. So they said, go and tell the children of Israel, let them bring the olives and let it be pressed. Verse 21 is where we're at, 20. It says, and let, bring the pure olive, pure oil olive. That's beaten for the light. Do you see it? Could cause the lamp to do what? Burn always. Now here's the thing. When Jesus was living, this is at the tail end of Exodus 20, uh, 27. Am I correct? Yes. How many of us remember what Jesus said to his disciples when he was about to go? He said to them, he said, it is expedient that I go. Because if I do not go, what cannot happen? The Holy Ghost cannot come to you. And when the Holy Ghost comes to you, what will be? He will lead you into where? All truth. He will be a light for your path. He will be the reason why you no longer make mistakes. Because he will be your teacher. He will be your guide. He will be your comforter. I don't know whether you see it in the Bible. And in Exodus 27, God was already saying to the children of Israel, he said to Moses, the children of Israel need to get together. Their fire, their light, the oil that is pressed out of them will, add, will become light for this lamp so that no God forbid that anyone will we enter into what is supposed to be the tabernacle and the presence of God and the lights would have gone out. Now, for those of us that were at a compassers, uh, sorry, Sister Power last Saturday, what happens when the Holy Spirit leaves? The glory departs. When the glory departs, what happens? <laughs> when the Holy Spirit leaves, the presence leaves. When the presence leaves, the glory departs. What is the name of that thing called? e cardboard. And if the Holy Spirit is the doing arm of God, if the Holy Spirit is the one that will lead you into all truth, if the Holy Spirit is your teacher, if the Holy Spirit will be your comforter, if it's the one that will give you direction, how can you not have oil when you come in? But oil doesn't flow by putting the olive on a stand and displaying it at GT Bank headquarters. Or World Health, the UN headquarters. Do you get it? Just put it there because it's a very big olive. Can you see the olive I did? It will rot. The only way oil will come out is that um, Brenda, we rub off on Boma 
and press Boma in all the ways that Boma does not want to press, be pressed. When that begins to happen, Boma has two choices. He can either endure it so that his oil can come out, or he can decide to push Brenda and Brenda will fall, and then his darkness continues. Verse 21. In, so that the, verse 20 says to cause the lamp to burn always in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil. So the tabernacle of the congregation is outside of the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there is light constantly. But where the children of Israel gather, there will be light for each other. I was talking to someone yesterday and I was telling her that until we, as the church, recognize that we can call others out of their darkness by being the light, we are an ineffective church. And that's not the one that Jesus is coming for. Until a pastor can be seen a guy and a lady coming to church every day, every Sunday together, and they are not brother and sister and they are not married. And the pastor cannot call. Can, until the pastor will fight, make it his responsibility to call them. So, Bo, are you living in the flat up and she's living in the flat down? Why are you always coming together? This oil we are talking about will not come out. Because what will happen is when that happens, the man is pressed. If it's the guy that's the church member, he's pressed so badly that he can do two things. He can either decide that, okay, this is not healthy for my relationship with God and cut ties until such a time as he's ready to marry. Or he can decide that this pastor is annoying me and change church. Either way, we are the better off for it. The first choice is better for all of us because he will grow. Do you get it? But if he chooses to go because well he doesn't want anyone in his business then at least some level of darkness has been taken out of the house the light continues to shine I don't know whether you get it God could not do much because the people could not believe in Jesus there are things that God will not do for you as God as is God so look at your Exodus 27 properly again. He said, when I saw it, I said, ah, of all the things we're talking about, why is it that the people are the ones bringing the olive? Because then you can stand and say that I am living well on my altar now. I am a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is my reasonable service. What is my reasonable service? My oil lights the lamps in the tribulation of the people. So when all is said and done, if you can go through, enter, see the altar, touch the horns of salvation, enter the courts, but you are not contributing to the lights. You are a curse in that environment. You are not a blessing. And God did not call us to be curses. What did he call us to be? Blessings. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Let me go to my notes so I can round up. In the tabernacle, the golden lampstands were the only source of light. And last week we said that this was typifying the Lord Jesus as the light of the world. And it was in the Holy of Holies, by the way. It is interesting to see that in Exodus 27, 20 to 21, God commanded Moses to ask the children of Israel to bring pure olive for oil. So that they can beat it to light. So that the lamp can burn always. Praise the Lord. First, what does oil stand for? Oil, as we know it, is the Holy Spirit, the lubricant of the Godhead. With the Spirit of God in us, our spirits shine brightly, that we become the light of the world. I said, remember the ten virgins. However, there is something about this oil that we see in Exodus 27. Exodus, it, 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 this thing about it is that it's a process of ex extraction. 
is highlighted. Do you get it? They could have said just bring olive oil. Then it would not be about the process. But because he didn't just say bring olive oil, he, he told us that it will be beaten. He told us that what God was interested in was more the process of extraction than the oil itself. Praise the Lord. Amen. This oil is beating out. In our work with God, even within the courts, life will beat us sometimes. But if we handle ourselves properly, life will beat out of us. The oil that will light the lives in his temple. Therefore, enabling others to find their way. A Christian who is not a light unto another person is a waste of space. I said it. A Christian who is not lighting the light of another person is a waste, absolute, colossal waste of space. Something very instructive is found in verse 21. In verse 21, you begin to see that Aaron the priest and his sons, whose responsibility it is to keep the light running, could only do so if the children of Israel brought lights. But when we go to church, we say our pastor is not anointed. His anointing is one person. There are 5,000 of you. How can his one anointing go around? Just imagine that he had floodlights. The more people that are there, the dimmer it becomes. But imagine that everybody that showed up, in addition to his floodlight, has halogen. How bright will that place be? So Aaron, with all his priesthood, could not do anything much with keeping the light running except the children of Israel brought their oil. The question is, will you allow anybody? Hi, Mr. Deborah. Good morning, ma. Will you allow God or life to press you so that your oil will come out? Will you? Praise Jesus. Not the thing I like about God. Whether you allow him or not, if it is important to him, he will press you. <laughs> So whether you say yes or you say no is not is not important. If God wants you, He will if He wants that oil out of you, He will press it out of you. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Is it therefore possible that the glory of God only covers the earth when we all align and pitch in? Is there a greater flow of His Holy of His Spirit? light and power when we all come together as light that's why I talked to you I said there is thank you ma'am that there is something called a corporate anointing when everyone is be sharpened what does the bible say iron sharpened iron and then we all show up in the room you've been praying all day in tongues I've been praying all day in tongues just because we all have rehearsal just because we all have a worship session just because we all have a class to take none of us is coming from the house of sin we are all on top of our game what do you think will happen it will not take three minutes for heaven to fall I can always tell when we come, when the people in the room were already preparing themselves to come. This morning, what happened was the people in the room had prepared themselves to come. From the first opening of mouth, Chinwe, am I lying? The Holy Spirit just came down. I can also tell when half of the room have gone to everything and everywhere before they got here. The one person who is carrying the fire we fan and fan and fan. They will almost break their neck. Nothing is moving. Because the weight and the deadness and the darkness of everybody else is pushing down. When you recognize this, you will recognize that you have a responsibility. When you gather with your brethren to come with an open mind. It is actually better for you not to show up than to show up angry. It is better for you not to show up than to show up petty. It is better for you not to show up than to show up in fear. Because then you will reduce the fire of everyone else who is there. I tell people, I said I don't even have a social life. And I'm okay with it. I don't need a social life. This is social enough for me. What is social, is social life? It's not when you see people and you talk to them. You say, Pastor, have I not seen you today? Am I not talking to you? And which one remember? remain 
What do I need to be going to all the all, all the places that you know, have you been to all these places lately? Have you been there lately? You've been saying I will not smoke, I will not smoke. Just get into as you get out of the airport, it's like they arrange a can of smoke waiting for you. They spray it on you as you just show up. I won't, I will not cuss, I will not cuss, I will not cuss. Every movie, every um, um, video, uh, music video is full of cuss words. I can't remember the last time I watched TV in my house. I don't, uh, please. That's not to say I don't watch movies. But I decided to subscribe to Netflix and I subscribe and I, I have YouTube. So I am in control of what I want to watch. And what I want to listen to. Are you with me? Because when we're talking about a pressing, it is not bad olive that is pressed to bring the oil that lights a lamp. Oh. It's not rotten olive. I mean, is it rotten one? It's fresh. Pure. That's the way the Bible describes pure. So imagine what happens for the Holy Spirit to show up when we gather. We all must come pure. Praise Jesus. Amen. To understand Exodus 27 today, what do you need to do? No, let me go back. Today, when two or three are gathered, today, whatever you ask in my name, today, you are the light of the world. Today, take up your cross and follow. Today, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Today, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Today, it is finished. Today, he who freely gave up his son, shall he not freely give us all things. Today, when you truly understand Exodus 27, all those things I just said to you will be the things that will be running around your head when you are studying it. To understand it, you need to do four things. Number one, give yourself away. Lay it down at the altar. Praise the Lord. Number two, come and come only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Trade your judgment for his redemption. Take upon you grace for grace. Put your yoke down and receive his rest. Praise the Lord. To be able to interact or transact with this scripture that we have studied today. Receive the Holy Spirit of God. And then go on and be the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. This is what it is about. Praise Jesus. The question is, am I ready? I need us to worship God. And I need us to worship God to the song by Psalmist Rain. No, actually do that hallelujah song. Louis, get up. What are you watching that you've gotten asleep on us? Let's do the hallelujah song. Let's worship the God of heaven. Let's see that. Let's rejoice because even in Exodus, God has written the victory for us. The victory did not come in Revelation at Armageddon. The victory, the victory came long before we started the journey. And so because of that, you can actually just rest and know that no matter what it is that life throws at me, ultimately I win. I win because no matter how life tries to press me, the oil that will come out of me can only light another person. Bring that, please start. The song of victory, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh. 